Okay, so can you hear me well enough? If I speak like this, great. So my name is Belinda. Please call me Belinda if you see me. Uh, I'm going to talk today about reducing Dynamin 2 as a potential therapy uh, for my tubular and central nuclear myopathy. So I'm going to talk about the research behind this approach. So if you don't know me, uh, as I said, I'm Belinda. I come from Australia, but I've been in France for the past 10 years. Uh, I came to France in 2008 to join Jocelyn Laporte's team. So I am Australian, but in the World Cup now, I'm supporting France tomorrow to see if we win. <laughs> Especially since Australia got kicked out fairly early, so that's over. So I think Yohan already gave us a nice introduction to the way the Jocelyn Laporte's team works at the IGBMC, where there's a, a large amount of research going on. So there is one part that Yohan manages, which is looking into the molecular diagnosis. So this just means finding the gene, finding new genes that are causing congenital myopathies. And then there's a part really focusing on trying to understand what's happening. So using either cells in a dish or using animal models, trying to understand why this mutation causes a disease. And then my part has been focusing on trying to develop therapeutic approaches. So we use these mouse models that are generated, use these mice that have a myopathic phenotype, and trying to test therapies to see if they can work. And so as part of this work in reducing Dynamin 2, the company called Dynacure was created late in 2016. And so I'm lucky enough now to move across to work in the research lab at Dynacure. So here you have the team members, at least at the management level, of, of Dynacure. And what you can see is there's several people attending this meeting. So I'm here. I'm happy to talk to you about everything that is to do with research. Uh, we have Chris Freitag that's up in the back with glasses on his head that's just recently joined as of the 1st of July and he's the chief medical officer. So he's the, the person in, in charge of taking this towards the clinic and having the first clinical trials hopefully planned for next year. And he's happy to speak to you at any stage throughout this meeting if you see him. And he will be giving a talk tomorrow morning to let you know what's happening at DynaQ and moving towards the clinical trials. And we also have the big boss, which is Stefan van Hoyen in the corner just next to Chris, the CEO of DynaQ. And he's also very approachable. So please feel free to come and talk to us at any stage over this weekend. We're here. So let's move into the research. So I want to talk to you about reducing Dynamin 2. So what we want to know is if we can reduce Dynamin 2 in several forms of central nuclear myopathy. So I'm going to talk to you about two particular forms today, myotubular myopathy, due to mutations in MTM1, and reducing Dynamin 2 in the dominant form of central nuclear myopathy, due to mutations in Dynamin 2. And so what we call this is cross-therapy, and we hope to be able to have the potential to treat all forms. And I'm talking about this at the level of the mice models. And so what's the idea behind this approach? Because it's a little bit complicated. But what we think in muscle is that this balance between MTM1 and Dynamin2 is essential for normal muscle function. So here you have scales and you show an equilibrium between my MTM1 and Dynamin2. But when something happens, like in the case of myotubular myopathy, where you have a mutation in MTM1 and you have less MTM1, thank you, we think that that tips these scales. And so that you can see in the middle panel here, that when you tip these scales by having less or no MTM1, that you get an abundance of Dynamin2. And that's actually what we had a look at in, in muscle biopsies from patients and also in the mouse model, and we found that there's actually more Dynamin2. And so what our idea was for cross-therapy is can we reduce the Dynamin2 level, not get rid of it, but can we reduce the Dynamin2 level to take these scales back to an equilibrium, to try and improve the function of the muscle? So that's what we tested in mice. So we used the same model that Anna presented to you earlier this morning, which is an MTM1 knockout mice. So if you remember, mutations in MTM1, it was explained, cause a reduction in the protein or no protein being expressed. We have a mouse that has no myotubularin protein being expressed. And this mouse has a very severe myopathic phenotype, and they tend to survive around 5 to 10 weeks in the lab. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to take this model and reduce Dynamin2 to around 50% at the genetic level. So we took these mice, we, we produced a mouse that has less Dynamin2. So in this experiment, we have three mice. We have what we call a normal mouse, which has a normal level of MTM1, a normal level of Dynamin2. Then we have our disease model, our myotubular myopathy model, which has no MTM1. And then we have the same mouse, still has no MTM1, and we reduce Dynamin2. And that's the video I show you now, hopefully. So probably you can see that 
this mouse here is the one that has no MTM1, so it's smaller already than the other mice in the cage, and he's having a lot of trouble moving around because he has a severe myopathy, a severe muscle weakness. And what you may notice is there's two other mice in the cage, and you can't really tell the difference between those mice. So one of them has normal levels of, of MTM1, the other one has no MTM1, but reduced dynamin 2. And I think the effect that you can see is that when we do this, in mice, we tend to get a, uh, an improvement back to a normal level where they become indistinguishable from the normal mice. So that was very encouraging, but here we removed mice genetically. And what I mean is that we took the parents, we manipulated the genetics, and we created a mouse that had no MTM1 and less dynamin 2. But that's not an option as a therapy to be able to give to these mice or to be able to translate to the clinic. So what we had to do next is try and translate this therapy. And so that's what I mean. How can we find something, a drug, a molecule, something that we can give that can then improve the phenotype? And so that's what we worked on next. And we wanted to choose a, an approach that could potentially be taken to clinic. So to think about how we're going to try and achieve this to reduce dynamin 2, we need to go back to basics. And luckily, Johan already explained that to you very nicely this morning, how it worked. So just a reminder, we have different genes. And these different genes, like MTM1 or Dynamin2, are part of the Sorry, I won't turn around. You can't hear me when I speak. A part of the chromosome. So we have many, many genes in the body. And these genes carry the information to make a protein. So you could say that Dynamin2, the gene, is like the manual to build a car. It has the instructions on how to do it. And then this gene encodes for what's actually functional in the cell. So that's where we have the protein, which is functional in the cell. So that you could say, Dynamin 2 is like the car. And here you have a picture of actually the fastest car ever made from Australia. It's, I don't know, the, I don't know details about a car. I know it goes up to 100 kilometers an hour in less than five seconds, but it's the fastest car made in Australia. So there are two possibilities to try and reduce Dynamin 2. We can either target it at the genetic level to stop producing as, as much Dynamin2 as we normally do, or we can go direct to the protein and try and block the Dynamin2 protein once it's in the cell, so at the level of the car. So what we decided to do is we decided to tackle this at the genetic level to try and to produce less Dynamin2 within the cells. And so to do this, we use what we call an antisense approach antisense oligonucleotide. So it's a big name. Francesco already introduced you to that a little bit earlier today. It's the approach, one of the approaches being used for SMA. Basically, these antisense oligonucleotides, or call them antisense drugs, work in a way where you have a very, very small stretch of nucleotides, a very small uh, uh, molecule or a string of nucleotides that are attached together. And what you do is you inject these into into the body and they travel and they go into the cells. And when they go into the cell, they hybrid with their target. So here, what we're trying to do is get this small molecule to go in and target the Dynamin2 gene. So it has a specific match for Dynamin. And what it does is it goes in and it binds to the Dynamin2 at the genetic level and it stops the production of the protein. So the overall result by this, this antisense drug going into the cell is to reduce the level of Dynamin2 that's being produced by the cell. So we're trying to use these antisense drugs, which target specifically Dynamin2, to reduce the level of Dynamin2 in our animal models. So that's what we did next. And these drugs are, are quite different to a gene therapy approach. There's advantages and disadvantages with every approach. Antisense drugs are, need a repeat treatment, as Francesco mentioned, and it means the treatment can be modulated throughout the treatment. So what we did is we injected these drugs, these antisense drugs, repeated injections into our mouse model. So we took the same MTM1 knockout mouse and we injected these antisense drugs. And here I have, I'm just going to show you two videos, I hope. Yes. So here we have an MTM1 knockout mouse before treatment. So this mouse is five weeks of age. You can see the mouse on the right-hand side here. Already he's much, much smaller than his litter mate. And you see that he's having more difficulty moving around. I think it's quite clear compared to the litter mate. The effects when you lose the myotubular and expressed in the muscle on the mouse. So this is at five weeks of age where it's quite a, a severe phenotype in the mice. And we asked them to hang from the lid of a cage. It's called the hanging test. And normally these mice that have 
uh, normal myotubular expression are able to hang from the lid of a cage for one minute. These mice can hang on maybe 5, 10, 20 seconds, but after they don't have enough whole body strength to be able to hang to the lid of a cage. And so you can see after 5, 10 seconds, this particular mouse is falling off the cage. And so now what I want to show you is the exact same mouse two weeks after treatment. And I'll play this one again. So this mouse now, you may see the difference if I play this one. This is the exact same mouse that I showed you in the first video. And now you can see already that he's much larger than he was and he's able to walk around with no problems really at all. And now when we ask him to hang from the lid of a cage, he has no problems. So he's able to hang, he has enough whole body strength to stay there for a minute very comfortably. So you can see there's quite a quick improvement in the space of two weeks by reducing Dynamin 2 with these antisense drugs in the mice. And he's exploring. And now, so this is a test we call the string test, where the mice have to pull their hind limbs up onto the string. He can perform this, ta uh, this test now, which is a very big achievement. What's probably even more striking is the fact that the test was performed at 11 weeks of age. And 11 weeks of age is normally past the time where these mice are able to survive with the disease. So we see a, a strong improvement, and it seems to be a lasting improvement. And here's a final test, a rotor rod test, where they have to run around the wheel. And you can see the two on the right have been injected with antisense drugs, and you can see they don't look any different to the mice, uh, the normal mice that have a normal level of mitubular and dynamin 2. So this is just a graph quantifying how long they can hang from the lid of a cage. The important thing to notice is how quick this reversion is. They start the test at a, only being able to hang from around 20 seconds. Within one week, this phenotype is stabilized. Within two weeks, they go back to a normal performance. So it's quite a quick response in the mice. And it's reverting the phenotype that we see in this mice, which is quite important. So. As I mentioned, we think that there's an imbalance between MTM1 and Dynamin2. We tested reducing Dynamin2 with these antisense drugs, and what we found is that when we reduce Dynamin2, you can go back to a normal lifespan, and a normal lifespan for a mouse is around two years, and they have the same muscle strength as a mouse, as a normal mouse. So what we wanted to know next is, could we apply this approach to other forms of centronuclear myopathy? And so that's what we did. So we focused next on the dominant form of central nuclear myopathy due to mutations in Dynamin 2 itself. And so we wanted to test whether if we reduce Dynamin 2 in this model, we can improve the phenotype. So there is a mouse available that has a point mutation, so one single mutation, and it's the same mutation found in the majority of patients that have a Dynamin 2 mutation. And when you express that in mice, you get a very mild, but measurable myopathic phenotype. So we see a phenotype in this mice, so we took this mouse model, we injected our antisense drugs to see if we could improve this mild myopathic phenotype. And I'm just gonna tell you two quick slides from this, looking at muscle biopsies from these mice. So when we look at muscle biopsies from mice, we can either look at the, take the whole muscle out and do a cross section of muscle, like you see here, or we can take out individual muscle fibers, and that's the image you have on the bottom. So this, this would be one fiber, and you can see we can isolate it out and have a look under a microscope. So we have different ways to have a look at these muscles to see whether reducing Dynamin 2 is improving this myopathic phenotype. So overall, when we look at these muscles, we see when they have this Dynamin mutation, they have a reduced muscle mass, so less muscle. They have a reduced muscle strength, so less muscle force, and they have smaller fiber size, so the individual fibers are smaller. And what we saw is when we treated with these antisense drugs, that we were able to improve both the muscle mass, and that's what's shown here, we get an improvement in the muscle mass back to a normal level, so the muscle size is increasing. We have an improvement in muscle strength, so the force that's being able to be generated by the muscles and that's what's shown here. And we have an improvement in fiber size. So either where we look at the histological image at the top across all the fibers, you may see that there, there seems to be an increase in fiber size. We quantify that and show that the fibers actually get larger, either by looking across all the muscles or by looking at individual fibers here. You can see that there's an increase. And so by reducing Dynamin 2 in this model, in this dominant form of central nuclear myopathy, we increase the mass, the strength, and the muscle fiber size. And then I'll show you one more slide. We have 
quite a mild but very distinguishable phenotype in this model where you get an accumulation of, of staining within the center of these fibers. So what you see here is an accumulation towards the center of the fiber, and that would be considered abnormal. And it occurs in up to around 5% of these fibers, but it's very distinguishable. When we treat with these antisense drugs and we reduce dynamin 2, what we find is that we completely eliminate that pathology. So we don't see those abnormal fibers anymore. So we're quite encouraged that when we reduce dynamin 2 in this form of the disease, in addition, we're able to improve the muscle mass, size, force, as well as the histological defects. So I explained to you two different forms, and I'm happy to explain to you in any more details at any stage during this meeting about those studies. We also have a third study that I'm not going to talk to you about today, but again, I'm happy to, to speak to you about it, showing that when we reduce dynamin 2 in a mouse model of the BIN1 or amplifysin 2 form of the disease, we get a very strong improvement in the survival and phenotype. What we don't know yet is whether or not if we reduce dynamin 2 in other forms of centrinucleomyopathy, and I've listed a few genes here, whether or not we can also have an improvement in the phenotype. So for those, we need good mouse models to be able to test whether we reduce dynamin 2 if we have a therapeutic effect. So I'm out of time. So just to let you know, everything I've explained is in mice. And as I mentioned, Chris is the CMO for DynaQ. He's in charge of trying to move this towards clinics. So he'll present to you tomorrow how we're taking this approach and we're moving it towards clinical trials. And thank you to all the teams involved. And one big final thank you to My Tubular Trust that has been involved in funding part of this approach from the very beginning. And we're very lucky as researchers to have the My Tubular Trust funding specifically research on this topic. And I think it's shown how important it is by how many thera therapeutic approaches now are being developed in labs, in academic labs, in mouse models, and are now moving towards the clinic. So a big thank you to my Tubular Trust. And Valentino, I didn't get to speak about her results, but we have a fantastic PhD student that's funded by my Tubular Trust too. So thank you. <laughs>